name is Gail Gibson Sheffield. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I've been asked to come on behalf of the faculty and welcome all of you to the first of our Academic Speaker Series for the fall. You know, the Adirondack Speaker Series is, is a mission to promote intellectual environment here on campus and to facilitate discussion of important issues. And I, um, our, our leader, Eve Leone, is she here? Um, she has been, she's the coordinator for this event and she and her team have put together a really great lineup of speakers this year. So I hope you take this opportunity to mark your calendars. But first tonight, um, we are most honored to welcome our own visiting lecturer in politics and leadership, Governor Peter Shumlin. Governor Shumlin holds a special place for us here at Landmark College because it's because of him that we call this place our home. Um, back, way back before the House and the Senate and the governorships, he was uh, the person responsible for bringing us to Wyndham College and making Wyndham College available to us. And, and he, along with other members of the community, really rallied to, to give us this place and to open up their community to us. And there's a lot of students out there who really owe you a lot of, of gratitude for, for making this happen. Governor Shulman was also on our original Board of Trustees and he, he was the speaker at our first convocation event in 1985. So he's really comfortable being on our stage, um, which is really exciting. But for those of you who don't know, he's actually known for a lot more than that around the state. Um, he is, uh, his, his service as a representative in Vermont House, a leader in the Vermont Senate, and three terms as Vermont governor. It was his leadership that has made, established Vermont as a leader in progressive policies. This is the first state to pass same-sex marriage, to guarantee universal pre-kindergarten education for all three and four-year-olds, to pass mandatory GMO labeling laws, and to achieve near universal health care coverage with the lowest rate of uninsured in the country. That's a really fantastic record, and that's just at the tip of the iceberg. It was also under his leadership that Vermont consistently ranked among the top states in solar energy jobs per capita and enacted a number of laws to boost renewable energy production and combat climate change, which is why Governor Shumlin was invited by President Obama to be at the Paris Climate Summit to push for global climate agreement. Um, that's what our topic here is tonight. Um, he's going to bring all of that experience and his own connection to Landmark College to talk about the importance of civic engagement and how students in particular can take a leadership role in addressing climate change. So please join me in welcoming our true friend of Landmark College, Governor Peter Shumlin. Hey, thank you, Gail, for that that beautiful introduction, and uh, some of it was true. Huh? I, I, a little more credit was given than is due, but thank you so much. It's great to be home at Landmark, and I'm honored to be here tonight with all you, with professors, faculty, uh, administrators, but most importantly with the students of this great institution. I'm really honored to be back. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about tonight about what I think is the most important issue that we're facing, which is climate change. But before I do, uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about me and where I came from, how I got to have the privilege of being the governor of the great state of Vermont for three terms, and what motivated me to get there, what made me want to be the leader of a state, and what made me wish to make change. So I'm glad to be here. I have my wonderful wife, Katie, here. She was, I think, the happiest day of her life was when she no longer had to be uh, first woman of the great state of Vermont. And uh, my great friend Larry Cassidy is here. We've got some old press friends here who promised me they won't write anything because I've been in hiding since I chose not to run again and pass the, the mantle on to Governor Phil Scott. But um, they might write anyway. And let's hear it for BCTV and Vermont Digger who showed up tonight. Yeah? <laughs> Kevin O'Connor is a local boy. Listen, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about who I am. So I, I brought a few slides, uh, but I was um, born and raised right here in the booming city of Putney, Vermont. And so I'm a local boy. And uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit of what, what, what motivated me to serve in public office. If you look at what's going on today, you might wonder why would anyone wish that upon themselves. 
And I can tell you that what really made me want to make change was from my own life experience. As many here at Landmark know, the reason that I care so deeply about this school, the reason that I was so excited to be a part of the founding of Landmark College, was that I am dyslexic. And I'm also a lot older than most of you students, so I was dyslexic before folks really knew what dyslexia was. So I've told this story many times, but when I got to second grade, and I know you've all, you're all familiar with being called in the principal's office, right? Raise your hand here if you were never in the principal's office. Yeah, exactly. We are in the same club. So one day around second grade, I got called into the principal's office, and I couldn't figure out why, because frankly, I hadn't done anything yet to warrant my being called into the principal's office that day. And I get there, and this is how we did it back in the 60s in Vermont. Uh, but they had my mom and dad sitting in the chairs, and no one will understand this better than landmark students. And they sat me down. This was the psychology of how to build confidence in a young dyslexic kid in those days. And the principal turned to my parents and said, listen, uh, we don't know what's wrong with Peter. Uh, we cannot teach him how to read. Uh, He's not going to go to college. We don't think he's going to have much of an academic future. But we're going to do the best we can. We just want to let you know that with all of our best efforts, uh, we can't teach him how to read. And then, you know, you can imagine you all have been in that situation one way or the other over the years. My eyes grew as big as uh, marbles. And uh, I was really upset, not because I knew that I not that, that it was news to me that I didn't know how to read, I knew that fairly well, but I thought that I was covering it up and that nobody else had noticed. So that was incredibly upsetting to me, and my parents were hearing it, it was incredibly upsetting, and that my principal knew it, it was incredibly upsetting, so I went back to class and did what we all do best, which was tried to hide in the back of the class. This is before special education, before IEPs, uh, kids like me and you uh, would learn how to blend into the back and hope that we wouldn't be noticed. So that was my grade school experience, I had a single teacher who came up to me weeks later. She was a wonderful woman. Many of the, people, the faculty here know her, knew her well when she was alive, Claire Oglesby. Anyway, she said to me one day, hey, uh, Peter, I would be willing to have you come home after school with me, and I'd, I, you know, I could work on your reading with you. Would you like to do that? I said, sure, I'd love to do that. So every day for about a year and a half, after school, just out of the goodness of her heart, because she saw something in me that other people didn't see. She would literally load me into her Willie's Jeep, and we'd go up to her log cabin where she and her school teacher husband, Mac, lived. And you know, by the way, I know I'm old and gray, but I want to assure you that not everybody lived in log cabins when I was a kid, but <laughs> they did. And uh, we would sit around the stove in the wintertime on our lawn in the summertime. It took her about a year, but she taught me how to read. I only tell you that story because it instilled in me uh, a strong yearning to make a difference. Because someone reached out to me when a lot of folks had given up and said, hey, I see something in this person that gives me hope that I want to reach out and help. I think that experience that you have had and that I have had, learning differently, facing the challenges, the self-doubt, the pain, the difficulty, but then rising above it, in fact, was a great strength that actually made me a better governor. And I say that because most of us in this room can't afford to be what I call lazy learners. I went to school with a lot of lazy learners. You know, they got A pluses and they didn't work very hard. You all worked with those people too, I'm sure. And what I always found about them was they could get the A, they could get the great grade, they could go to great schools and all that, but if you ask them in terms of street smart to solve a problem, they didn't do what we have to do. They didn't think about how they were going to get to the end before they started at the beginning. And let me tell you, that's a great attribute in any leadership role that you might 
seek in the future. So with all the pain and all the difficulty and all the self-doubt and all the issues that people who learn differently face, I would argue that my learning difference was and is today my greatest asset. Now I know it doesn't always feel that way, and I know it didn't always feel that way, but I think with Landmark and a great education, someday you will feel the same way if you don't today. So before I talk a little bit about climate change, I want to fast forward. I ran for governor because I wanted to make a difference for the state that I loved. But I wanted more than that. I think that because I had been beaten up, because I had been doubted, because I knew very well that if it hadn't been for people like Claire, I could well have ended up in the place that that principal told my parents I was probably going to end up that I've always wanted to fight harder for people who don't have a voice, for people who aren't given a chance, for people who we make judgments about based on all kinds of preconceptions that don't belong to them, but belong to each of us. So a few examples of that. As a governor, I was particularly proud to be the first governor to pass universal pre-K regardless of your income. The first state to pay for the Claire Oglesby that gave me a start. The, I was proud to be one of the first public officials to stand up and fight for people who are suffering from heroin op and opiate addiction. You know, why would a governor do that? I remember I came in, I said to my staff, you know, I've been going around Vermont as governors do, and I kept talking to parents and grandparents and kids and addicts who were suffering from this disease. And he kept saying, you know, there's no treatment. You can throw us in jail. And I started going into the prisons and talking to prisoners. It used to drive my security detail nuts because I'd go into the men's prison and the women's prison and I'd say, I'm going in to learn about what we're doing wrong on dr drug addiction. And you're not coming with me into the cell. They said, oh, you can't do that. They'll kill you in there, or whatever. I said, no, wait a minute, think about it. You know, you're, you're their greatest enemy in their minds. You're the one who arrested them. So I'll get more out of them if I can go talk. You can be nearby, but you can't be right in the center of it. Anyway, my point is, I went out and talked to folks, and I learned that we were doing everything wrong on drug addiction that first we were passing out oxycotton like candy, which is heroin in pill form. Then we would get folks addicted to FDA-approved drugs. You know, President Trump and these guys say, oh, the South Americans, we've got to build a wall, we've got to keep the drug dealers out of here. I keep saying, hey, our worst drug dealers right now are on the corner drugstore. But then folks would get addicted, suffer from a terrible addiction, we'd throw them in jail without treatment, and let them out back on the streets expecting to survive. So we changed the rules in Vermont. We made it so that if you'll go into treatment, if you'll get the help you need, and we built out treatment centers like MAD all over the state, we led that effort in America, I would argue. You don't see a judge, you don't have a court record, and you don't have a criminal record if you go back into treatment, you get back with your family, get back into your job, and get re reintroduced into a, a workable and livable society. I don't think I would have done that if I hadn't always had in my mind that a lot of folks who learn like me are the ones who end up in the prisons, who end up addicted, who end up at the other end of what we call a humane society. I was proud to be the governor that welcomed Syrian refugees when we were the state that was standing pretty much alone in America against the majority of governors in 2009 who were building fences around their states for the first time in American history and saying, no, we don't want those people in our state. That was the majority of America's governors. No, we do not want people like that in our state, as babies were watching up, washing up on the beaches 
of Greek islands because they were escaping rape, torture, and death in their home countries. Popular? Not particularly. Important? You bet. Fighting for folks who didn't have a voice? Yes. I would argue that's what we all do best. So that's a little bit about who I am. I want to talk about one particular issue that I worked hard on, which was energy. When I ran for governor, I spent a lot of time. I had a, the first time around, I had a rough race. I had a, I had a five-way Democratic primary. We had over 66 debates just in that primary, only in Vermont, you know, imagine that. Then I had to go up against a uh, popular lieutenant governor at the time who had had no primary. He'd been uh, resting for the primary season. Uh, and uh, I had to, you know, I was the underdog in that race. And uh, we pulled it out. But one of the things I said, one of, the, one of the big arguments in the campaign, there were plenty of them, was this. I said, listen, you've got to remember where we were historically at that time. Obama had just begun his presidency. He'd been in for two years. We were in the bottom of the worst recession in American history. Every politician in America was talking about one issue. What was it? No, it was jobs. Jobs was the, you know, Obama was overseeing the end of the Bush recession. We were losing millions of jobs every single month. And we were down on our knees, as was the world economy. So there wasn't a politician in America who wasn't running on jobs. I said, listen, I want to run for governor and I want to create jobs. But I'm going to do it a little differently than some folks. I believe if you want to create jobs, you need to have the best education system in the country, and therefore we're going to get early childhood education, give everyone a strong start. But I said, on energy, this is what we're going to do. We're going to shut down the leaking, aging nuclear power plant, which happens to be here in Wyndham County, the only nuclear power plant we had in the state at the time, Vermont Yankee. And instead, we're going to build out renewables and do energy efficiency like mad. And I said, in the process, we'll do three things. We will, number one, create jobs. Because as you move and transform from any energy system, whether it's technology or anything else, you create all kinds of jobs. You go build solar panels and wind, wind turbines, do energy efficiency, you're going to create jobs. So we'll create jobs. I said, second, we'll put money in Vermonters' pockets. Because I firmly believe that their electric rates will be lower than if we stick with the flawed plan we're on right now. And I said, third, and most importantly, we will show the rest of the country how one small state can take a step in ensuring that we have a green, clean energy future so that this planet might just have some semblance of having, having some hope of being livable for future generations. My opponent said what Republicans still say. Climate change, many Republicans, climate change doesn't really, isn't man-created. Listen to your president. This guy will lose you jobs, not create jobs. In fact, when he shuts down Vermont Yankee, you'll lose 600 and some jobs right there. Second, he'll cost you money, take money from your pockets, because electric rates are going to go up, not down, because renewables, he claimed, are more expensive than traditional energy sources. And finally, it'll make no difference on climate, since it's a small state and climate isn't created by human beings anyway. So that was sort of the debate. Well, I won, and I went to work. And one of the first bills I signed was a comprehensive energy bill that created a target of 90% renewable for Vermont by 2050. Now remember, when I got elected governor, Vermont had no energy plan. When Vermont changes governors, we change parties too. We've done that since the early 60s. So I was replaced by a Republican. I replaced a Republican. Uh, there was no energy plan for Vermont. So I got my team together. We had hearings all over the state. We created a great energy plan. Then we passed a bill. And I'm going to give you the short version of the story. It really did a number of remarkable things. First, it built out so we built out solar over my three terms at an unprecedented rate for any state. Second, we built wind like there was no tomorrow for this little state. We put up wind. We virtually had almost no wind turbines except a small project right here between Wyndham and Benedict County. 
we built wind. Third, we transformed our energy companies into energy efficiency companies. So what do utilities do in America? They try to sell as much juice as they can to consumers. That's basically the energy model to this day in America. If you won't go today to Green Mountain Power or Burlington Electric or Washington Electric, they're actually in the energy efficiency business. Because of the bills that we passed and the work that we did with really progressive CEOs led by, remember Vermonters get 80% of their juice from one utility company called Green Mountain Power, including Landmark. Their CEO happens to be a woman named Mary Powell who doesn't think like all of the mostly men who run utility companies in America. And she said, hey, this guy's got a point. He's right on. Let's work with them to transform our company to energy, in an energy efficiency company. And with on-bill financing that we passed in this bill that I'm signing in this picture, we literally transformed the company into a company that now will come into your home with on-bill financing, so you don't have to pay up front, because that's the big challenge for the conversion. You don't have the cash to do it. They will rip out your old emission-creating oil burner, replace it with solar panels on your roof, in your yard, or a C CSA down the road. They replace the oil burner with a cold weather heat pump that's driven by your solar panels. They rip out your old doors and windows in our mostly aging houses and replace them. This is all one-stop shopping. They don't do it all, but they arrange it all. They'll blow your house so tight with cellulose that you gotta open the windows in the wintertime, I say, to breathe. You get cooling in the summer because the cold air hot pump, heat pump creates a great environment in the summertime. And your electric bill over time, combined electric and oil, your old oil bill, you're no longer burning oil, will go down, not up. Anyway, it was a remarkable transformation for a little state. While we were doing this work, we were reminded of how important climate change is when tropical storm Irene hit in the beginning of my first term. It wiped out over 500 miles of roads, dozens and dozens of bridges. It killed seven innocent Vermonters who literally got swept down little brooks that became raging rivers. It destroyed houses. It destroyed businesses. It made it impossible to move from east to west because our east-west roads were wiped out. It was an unmitigated disaster that cost almost a billion dollars to recover from. This little state with 625 plus people, 1,000 people. Anyway, the storm which displaced wildlife, wiped out covered bridges that had been up for hundreds of years, roads, as I mentioned. This is an example. I, I, I helicoptered into a small community. The only way you get around was by helicopter. Just to try to give hope to folks that had lost everything. This is a wonderful man, his wife, two daughters, went to bed in their little house in Rochester, woke up the next morning, that's, that was their home. They lost it all. There were stories and stories all across Vermont of tears and tragedy. Really tough time for our little state. So it just reminded us that the work that we were doing, that the fight that we were fighting mattered, and that the storm that we were experiencing, and we had two others, quick succession, weren't not as bad as Irene, but just did a lot of damage, reminded us of the imperative, uh, of, the, of the clicking clock, of the fact that our time was running out, a harbinger of what lies ahead in a climate change-induced world. So what about the promise in the original debate? I said jobs, I said money in your pockets, I said show a little state how climate change has an impact. This is what we did. Vermont, in my governorship, ranked, became the number one solar state in America, as judged by the Union of Concerned Scientists. So I'm not making this stuff up. Number two, today, or at least when I was governor, if you had, seven, if you had 17 Vermonters in a room, one of them is in the renewable energy business. Let me tell you something about those jobs that we created. We, we ended up with one of the lowest unemployment rates in America. But one of Vermont's challenges, as is true throughout the Northeast, is keeping young people like you in our state to work, 
we're a green aging population. You go and have a, a meeting with those one in 17 employees who are out building solar panels and doing energy efficiency, building wind until this new governor came in who banned it. Let me tell you something about them. They don't look like me, they look like you. They're young, they're energetic, they're optimistic. They love Vermont, they love living here, and they love building a greener, cleaner future. And they know it's up to them because old duffers like us have missed the mark. We grew wind by 22 times, think about that. 22 times more wind turbines. Solar by 11 times. You know, as governor, I drove around the state constantly because I don't like, like most of you, I don't like sitting behind a desk. So I governed from the road. I bet I didn't spend 20 hours of my governorship sitting behind a desk, six years. And every time I drive up, you know, the major roadways, for a while there, I'd see more solar panels that I didn't see the last time I went around. It was a remarkable transformation. So we moved the state towards our goal of 90% efficiency by 2050. We made great progress in greening our electric generation. We've got a lot more to work, or work to do in greening our transportation system, moving to EVs from gas-powered cars. 50-50, roughly. 50% 50 of Vermont's global climate change contribution comes from electricity. The other 50%, roughly, comes from transportation-induced pollution. So it was a pretty remarkable change. And when, Governor, uh, when President Obama was heading over to the Climate Accord in Paris, uh, he called a few governors because he had inherited a Republican Congress who didn't really believe in climate change. So he wasn't to get every, able to get everything done that he wanted to get done. So he asked Governor uh, Inslee of Washington State, who got a lot done out there, Governor Brown of California, who got a lot done there, and myself from Vermont, to go to Paris and tell world leaders that America wasn't sitting on its duck, that there was stuff happening despite the attitude of Republicans in Congress. So I went to Paris. I was really honored to go with the other governors. And uh, who's that guy? Huh? Who's the guy on the left? There you go. So I just, I threw this slide in because it's a great story. I was, maybe it's not a great story, but I was at the White House one day having a meeting. And at the end of the meeting, I saw governor, by the way. He was governor of Pence of Indiana when I was governor of Vermont. And, you know, we worked together on some issues. But... I saw him beeline for the president, and everyone else was taking off. And I said, well, I, I got to go. He, he, you know, he was, seemed a little riled. And we were heading off to Paris, and he, I decided I'd just you know, help out my friend. And he was on a tirade. And he said, you know, Indiana. He said, we burn a lot of coal. And that's how we power our futures in Indiana. And what we don't use for coal, we use fossil fuels. And we got a lot of industry. And if you go over to Paris and sign this climate agreement, it's going to kill jobs in Indiana. It's going to send our power rates up. It's going to hurt our pocketbooks, hurt jobs, and it doesn't make any difference on climate because that stuff's not man-made anyway. And I thought, wow, I've heard this argument before. So I was there just helping, helping my friend calm the governor down from Indiana. Anyway, it's ironic. Who's that? Huh? Yeah, who said that? Yeah, there you go. Who's he? Yeah, so isn't it ironic? He was one of the people that worked with President Obama to get other countries to agree to the most important climate agreement, I would argue, in the history of politics. Now, isn't it ironic that today we sit here at Landmark at a time with the clock ticking, at a time where there are more forest fires every year. Look at what happened this year right here in our own country. More floods, what we worried about just two weeks ago down in Carolinas. More natural disasters like Irene. 
So the clock is ticking faster and faster. We're losing time. Who is it right now that is driving the big three automakers in America to finally get off their duffs and start building electric vehicles? Who is it? Is it President of the United States? No. What does the President of the United States say about all this? It doesn't exist. So who's driving the Auto 3 in America to build EVs as fast as they can? Well, who's the CEO of Ford? Motor Company. Here you go, he's a guy named Ford. Yeah, you know? So that Ford, yeah, the other one's dead, but there's still more Fords. So why is Ford and, you know, the Chrysler guys and, you know, the General Motors dudes, mostly men, why are they scrambling to build EVs right now? Not the American president leading the way, as Obama did, but you've got the president of China, if you believe President Trump, our enemy, telling the big three, if they don't build EVs, they can't sell electric cars in China. And where's the market going to be? Who's going to buy more cars than anybody in the future? China. So we literally now, this is a shot that uh, he was working in Paris, and I was honored to work with him. If you had told me, just in the Paris Climate Accord, before Trump trashed it, hey, you know, that's an important shot because that's going to be the guy that drives the U.S. automakers to finally do the right thing, I would have said, come on, that's crazy stuff. This is insane. What are you talking about? What's President Xi got to do with it? Now we all know he does. So why does it matter to you? This is the last slide. I'll be quiet. I want to take questions. This is why I'm here tonight. Listen, team. You are getting the biggest problem dumped on you in the history of the human species. If you don't act quickly to get off of fossil fuels altogether, I would argue that your kids, not your grandkids, your kids, and frankly, if you live long enough, you have an unspeakably horrid future. Now, I didn't come here to cheer you up, but I don't want to get you depressed either. I have never seen a country more innovative than our own. And I've never known people who want to do the right thing more than people who had to fight to get there. And there's no one that fights harder than landmark kids because of where you've been, because of the journey you've been on. So here's my message tonight. The clock is ticking. You know, when Bill Gates was considered a geek with his wire glasses, and he was building something called computers, you know, it wasn't that long ago. I remember when I came back to Putney from college to work at Putney Student Travel, my dad wanted to buy a computer for our business that would take names, so when he wrote a letter, it could automatically put a name in every letter through this computer thing, and it would say, Dear Peter, but you could just run it off this computer. And he wanted to buy a $100,000 IBM computer that literally would be today half the size of this stage, okay? Now, I ain't that old, I'm old. My wife's got my cell phone, but Lift that thing up. I mean, you can now do with an iPhone 20 times what that $100,000 box was going to be installed in our offices. My point is this. Solar is great. Wind power is great. Energy efficiency is great. But if we face this challenge and you all spend some time getting the best education you can and dedicating some part of your life to being a part of the solution. I'm convinced, number one, there's huge economic opportunity because a lot of money is going to be made. Ask Bill Gates or Larry Ellison or any of the people that were early on in a technology revolution. If you don't believe them, go talk to the CEO of Ford's great-grandfather, Henry, if you can find him at his grave, and ask him how he did going from building automobiles one car at a time 
to what they now call the Industrial Revolution. Lots of money was made. Huge opportunity in helping to solve this problem, but huge obligation. So my message is a simple one. Work hard here. Then get on with it. Go make a difference. And dedicate some part of your life to ensuring that we change the way we do energy. Because if I could tell you that I've observed right here in Putney, to bring it back home, in my lifetime, the changes that have happened to our climate right here in the time that I've been on this earth, if that happens in your lifetime, and we keep building and burning fossil fuels with irrational exuberance, future generations will not be able to live on this planet, nor will anyone else. The stakes have never been higher. The opportunity has never been greater. It's up to you, and I know you can do it. Thank you. So I would love to answer questions from anyone that has one on any sub topic. Yes. It's well, about. Uh, and tell me your name. Just tell me your name. And, and, it's on Derek. Yeah. Yeah, Derek Cristiano. Well, I do have a question about how, how oh, Vermont is is also one of the most energy savers. We have the compost heap. We have have a basically organic fuel stuff. Uh, so I was just wondering, and yeah, Vermont's been doing that for a long time. I mean, other states have start to do it. And so how come Vermont kind of gave it the power to go do that first, and then uh, when the rest of the United States, like the president, had been right. implementing that? Yeah, and I don't want to exaggerate what we did. There's some other states that are doing great stuff too. Jerry Brown in California has done some amazing stuff with renewables. Washington State's done some real leadership. Massachusetts, frankly, under two governors, Democrat and Republican, is making, are making some progress. There's progress being made around the country. It's too slow. What I, from all of us, including Vermont, too slow. You know, the, there was a huge reaction. What's, what's the one thing we know about change? A governor comes in and says, we're going to build out solar like mad. We're going to build out wind like mad. We're going to say, what happened? What's the reaction of people when change starts happening? It's, it's not an overnight thing. It's not an overnight thing. But what else? Go to the emotions. What happens to your emotions? About change. You know, things change all of a sudden. Yeah, it makes you uncomfortable, right? Makes you a little bit pissed off, too. So I had a lot of reaction to this. When I was done being governor, you know, on a lot of fronts, people were ready, to, ready for me to retire. But uh, I, I, one of them was what I did on energy. People said, these wind turbines that Shumlin's leading are, are ugly. Uh, uh, they, they, they shouldn't be on our mountaintops. We're a beautiful state. And I kept saying, well, yeah. They, I, God, the last uh, energy project I did, I, I, clipped, I came around the corner to clip the fingers of a big wind turbine project. And some of my own environmental friends were out there. Uh, they were waving, uh, you know, I won't be too specific, but they were waving a finger at me. And it wasn't, it wasn't the thumb, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like this. Uh, it wasn't even like this, you know, it was, it was more explicit. And, and, and they had signs saying, someone's killing the bear, someone's killing the bats. And I kept saying to them, listen, uh, I don't get you. I mean, we've all got to play our part. We've got to do this smart, but we've got to play our part. And I said, I don't discriminate based on color, not even against bears. And uh, we have black bears in Vermont, and I love them. But I've got huge sympathy, frankly. You know, I'm just probably as a PC. I've got sympathy for polar bears, too. And if you go talk to the polar bears right now, you ask them how it's going. And if you could speak bear, they'd say to you, well, we're in trouble. You know, this ice cap thing is kind of important to us. It's where we breed. It's where we feed. And it seems to be melting at an exorbitant rate, you know. So, it's all how you look at things. But my point is, change makes people uneasy. The next governor who replaced me got elected, and one of the things he said is, we will ban wind in Vermont. There's no more wind being built in Vermont right now. That is 
a mistake. Time is running out. We must do all of the above. So I just want to say we're not perfect. Now, why did we get it started here in Vermont and some other states? I would argue because we see it. We see it every day. When you think of Vermont, what do you think of? Nature. Well, yeah, but I mean products. What do you think of? Maple syrup. Now, do they make maple syrup in New Jersey? No. 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 Do they make maple syrup in Georgia? No. no. Now, fact. If you talk to reliable scientists, they'll tell you Vermont will have New Jersey's climate in the next couple of decades. If you're a maple sugar maker and you're watching the stress on your trees, which they're seeing, you're pretty nervous right now. So we got lots of maple sugar makers who don't need to be convinced about climate change. What else do you think of in Vermont besides maple syrup? Dairy. Huh? Dairy. Well, think recreation. Dairy for sure, but think recreation. Skiing. What do you need to ski? No. Yeah, it sure helps. Sure helps. <laughs> Right? Mountains. mountains are good, but mountains without snow aren't so great. So, you know, we put in all this high tech snow making equipment, which frankly we didn't have when I was a kid. Because when I was a kid, it started snowing at Thanksgiving. Ask Cassidy or Kevin here, or even Small here has been around long enough to know this. We had snow. You know what? It came from Mother Nature. We didn't have to make it. It came in November and it ended in June, you know, or May anyway. Late April. Wow. Seriously. And you know what? We didn't have buckthorn. We didn't have invasive species. We didn't have blue-green algae in the Great Lake in Vermont, Lake Champlain. I could go on forever. My point is, we see it every day because we're close to the land. And when you're down in New York or Pennsylvania or Kentucky, you know, it's just a different story. They're starting to believe, too, as more and more storms come through. Yeah? What can people from states that have no wind energy at all do to support the climate? Run for office and call the politicians out who are in the pockets of the petroleum industry and the energy and the oil companies and the, and the utility companies. Uh, That's what's holding you back. It really is. No, you're not. There's no such thing. If you're 18, you can run. Yeah. Um, I drive an electric car, but there are certain parts of the state that I can't access, like because they're too far away from the nearest charging station. I, I can't. I can't. There's certain parts of the of the state that I can't. Right. Access. Um, Listen, we're failing miserably on moving our transportation fleet to renewables, and frankly, so is every other state in America. So, are there plans to expand on the infrastructure? Yeah. Um, so. Premier Charest and I, and then uh, uh, the current premier, who's a great guy, uh, we, we put charging stations, we committed to do private uh, charging stations, which we didn't have at the time, from Montreal to southern Vermont. And then we got Governor Baker, who's a Republican, Massachusetts, to agree to extend, to ball Patrick started it, but to extend it down to Boston. But you know, it shouldn't be a boutique issue. The second part is, the big three's got to start building EVs that compete with four-wheel drive, higher, uh, higher cars to be a Vermont car. You know, we got mud seats. You know, and so I would argue that the industry, because they like making money on fossil fuel and they are in bed with the fossil <coughs> fuel industry, until President Xi put a little pressure on him about 12 months ago, uh, has had no interest in building EVs. You know, they kind of do it as a side. I think that's going to change very, very quickly. So keep hope alive. I would argue that today's EV looks like the computer that my dad wanted to buy when I first came to work at Putney Student Travel. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm personally someone who like believes in like state sovereignty, but what's that mean? Like state, like states are like allowed to like do things. Right. Yep. Well, it's our only hope right now because nothing comes, nothing happens in Washington. Yeah, right. yeah. But due to the urgency of the climate change issue, do you think that it might be necessary for the federal government maybe to have to cringe on that a little bit just to make climate change like more of an urgent thing that states are concerned about? Yes. I think that President Obama wanted to get a lot more done than he could. Uh, I think if he hadn't had a Republican Congress and a Republican Senate, you would have seen huge action there. He was frustrated by it. And I think we desperately need a president 
that's going to make this the number one top priority for this country. We're in trouble. If we keep our head in the sand, if we keep doing what we're doing, uh, you know, and I'm not a scientist. I, I, you know, I flunked every science course I ever took. But I've done enough reading on this to believe that the scientists are correct and that we have about a 10-year window, maybe less, to drastically change the way we're powering the world. And if we don't do that, as I mentioned, our little Irene will look like a keen little storm. And you can see it happening. Now think about how we built the civilized world. We're all on the water. And when you read the science of it, you talk about, <coughs> talk about three meters of sea rising. Do you, does anyone think about what that would mean? Has anyone thought about that? Look at all the population centers of the world. What, they're built on the water because they had to get there by ship, right? I mean, three meters. Everything that we know of major population centers, almost entirely exclusively, with exceptions in this country in the Midwest, are underwater. That's kind of big. Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned uh, tearing down an old uh, not, not nuclear power plant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think of uh, like the proposed newer, safer, and more efficient models uh, for like uh, carbon-free power? Right. So I have to say two things about nuclear power. The first is it can't compete with renewables for price. Listen, the part I didn't tell you that I forgot, when I said we were going to put money in Vermonters pockets, listen, for four of the six years that I was governor, our electric rates went down or were flat. I'm not making this up. Go look at your bills. Electric rate, I mean, the press doesn't write this stuff because, you know, I hate to sound like Trump. They don't like, they don't, they can't sell a positive story anymore. But go look at the six years that I served as governor. For three of those years, Green Mountain Power, 80% of the state, the bills went down from the year before. And for one of them, they were virtually flat. Nuclear power cannot compete with that. It costs so much to build those plants, number one, the sec without huge subsidies from the feds. And the second fallacy about nuclear power is, what are we going to do with the waste? Right now, the waste of the nuclear power plant that we were told the federal government was going to have a huge solution to it 45 years ago and take it away when it was built, it's now sitting in dry casts on the banks of the Connecticut River in Vernon, Vermont. Now, there isn't a scientist who would tell you that the best place to store high-level nuclear waste would be the banks of the Connecticut River in Vernon, Vermont. All right? So I say to nuclear, listen. Show me the evidence. But all I've seen so far is cost through the roof and nuclear waste you don't know what to do with. And we don't need more problems in America. Maybe one more question? Who gets the last one? There's got to be a woman here who wants to ask a question. Yes. I actually have two. OK, I'm going to give you two. <laughs> so the first one is, how did you have to deal with Governor um, mostly Republican states, like for example, I'm originally from a Democratic state too. Mm -hmm. I currently live in Alabama, which is a Republican state. How, how did you have to deal with them opposing to your climate change? Well, you know, I'll tell you something about governors that's a little different than what happens in Washington. Yeah. We actually work together pretty well. I'm not, I don't need to say this stuff and blow smoke, you know, I'm just telling the truth. I'll tell you a story about your governor, Governor Bentley, remember him? Yeah, but it, it ended not so well, I know. Yeah. No, I know, I read the story, I followed it. Let me tell you something about Governor Bentley before the mistress or whatever. I, I don't care what people do in their personal lives. But Bentley, uh, you know who one of my greatest allies? He's a doctor. Now, Governor Bentley and I, you would think, politically, he's a, you know, he would tell you he's a right-wing Republican and I'm a lefty, right? You would think we would be able to work together on just about nothing. Do you know who my greatest ally was on, on getting the FDA to rescind its asinine decision to pass out Oxycontin like candy after the manufacturer, Purdue, admitted to lying to the FDA under oath that it was non-addictive and telling the entire healthcare community, including Governor Bentley, doctor, that he could pass this out to patients to kill pain and it wouldn't hurt them. 
you know, Purdue pleaded guilty to this. They paid a fine. This is how white collar crime works in America. They paid a fine, 700 million bucks, for lying to the FDA. Big deal, they sold $11 billion worth of that year. We sold, we prescribed in 2010, 250 million prescriptions of Oxycontin. How many adults do you think there are in America? Yeah, 250 million. We all got our own bottle of this stuff. You know how I found that out? I was watching the Super Bowl one day. And I'm watching the Super Bowl, and one of these ads comes on. I know I'm going longer than I should, but one of these ads comes on. And you know, they've got these beautiful pharmaceutical ads. What's the most expensive advertising on TV? Super Bowl. What's it cost for 30 seconds? Million. How many millions? 5.6 million, roughly. So I'm watching this ad, it comes on, it's for, it's for constipation, right? Now raise your hand if you think constipation is a great thing to have. All right, so no one wants constipation. So I figure, well, listen, I'm just washing it, you know, doing whatever, drinking, sipping my beer. I don't want to sound like Kavanaugh, but I'm sipping my beer, <laughs> and I'm watching the game, and I never blacked out. And uh, all of a sudden, if, if the ad keeps going, it says, constipation for opiate addiction. As a, as a result of opiates. I'm going, how can these guys spend 5.6 million bucks? There can't be that many Americans who are suffering from constipation from Oxycontin. So I Google it. 250 million prescriptions in 2010. That's a bottle for every American. You bet your butt they can advertise for 5.6 million for 30 seconds. So my point is, Bentley was a great ally <coughs> on this issue. Because he saw the patients getting addicted. He knew that Purdue would lie. He knew that it was a criminal thing that America continues to pass this stuff out. And Republicans and Democrats do not stand up to them. They're equally culpable because they're all taking the money to fund their campaign. Every single one of them with very few exceptions. So my point is, you work with people and you find their strengths and you draw out their strengths in whatever you do in life and grab onto their strengths harness them like they're your best friend. That's what Governor Bentley did to me before he resigned. Awesome, and Governor Cuomo, too. He's Governor Cuomo, yeah, we worked together on all kinds of issues. Yep. And Come on, go ahead your next question. Yeah, my next question was, do you think climate change had to do with one of the levees breaking out in New Orleans after Katrina? Absolutely. I would argue that, I mean, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's not fair because they didn't maintain them. But listen, the fact that New Orleans, New Orleans, and other cities Keep getting struck by storm. This is an amazing thing about America. How many times, whether it's a forest fire, you know, my wife's sister got burned out of her home in California. I mean, she had to move out. The street in back of her got burned down. Her, her box, just by, by chance, didn't get hit. Right? Didn't get burned to the ground. Everybody else got burned to the ground. So what's the press call that? No. Read the press on storms like this, or fires, everything. It's a hundred year storm. Everything's a hundred year storm. That's what they say. Go read the press. There was a hundred year forest fire. There's a hundred year storm. I'm going, how many hundreds of years have I been on this earth? I'm seeing this stuff every few weeks. <laughs> Listen, you all are great. Thank you so much for having me. Here's my closing comment. I'm begging you, I'm imploring you. You have one of the greatest gifts that could be handed to you. You know what it's called? Grit, drive, ambition, fight. You've been kicked in the head. Lots. They make the best leaders. Get the best education you can. Suck this place dry for knowledge and go get them. Our hope is on your shoulders. Thank you.